Good morning, church family. Uh, we take this time to partake of our communion, and we do this together to remember Christ's death and what it means to us. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, uh, Paul writes about exactly how this affects us, not only in our future, but in our current state in this life. Uh, starting in verse 3 of chapter 6 in Romans, he says, Do you not know that so many of us that were baptized in Jesus Christ were also baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. As Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk in newness of life. The death of Christ was only the beginning. It was actually his resurrection from the dead 
that showed the victory over death. We gain so much from that. We're given the promise and the hope of eternal life because of his sacrifice, because of his death, and because he overcame that death and was raised from the dead. In verse 6, it says, Now if we are dead with Christ, we also believe that we shall live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, he dies no more, and death has no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That victory gives us the hope of eternal life. So when we come together, we come together to remember that death has no more grasp over us, but that life is our future. And next Sunday, uh, we're opening up again to have our brothers and sisters meet at the, the building on at 700 Brooks Avenue to again be united as one to partake of the communion together. But in any time we do this, we remember that it was Christ's resurrection that gained the victory and gives us the hope of heaven with our Father. And when we take on his death, we also take on his life. So let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread that represents your son's body that was hung on the cross for us. We're so grateful for his willingness to give his life for the people that he loved. We pray that you will help that to be known throughout the world and that we will be a light to those around us and always represent his death and his resurrection in you and the way that we live. We again pray that you bless this bread and us as we take it. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. And let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again. We thank you for this opportunity to remember your son and his sacrifice for us. We pray that you will help us to remember that this fruit of the vine represents his blood that was shed for us. And Father, we're grateful that through his death, we are able to uh, go through him to you and have eternal life with you. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. And may God bless you. Good morning. I'm Dennis Connor, and welcome once again to Online Worship with the Brooks Avenue Church of Christ. I hope that you were able to, to catch our uh, recorded service from last week in which Peter Severance shared his story about how he came to faith in Christ. Uh, it, it's a beautiful story of how God was working in events throughout uh, years in Peter's life to find him and to bring him to faith in Jesus. If you haven't had an opportunity to, to, to hear Peter's story. I hope that you'll, you'll check out our Brooks Avenue Church of Christ channel on YouTube and catch that beautiful and powerful story. I also have one important announcement that I would like to share with all of you today, and it is that next Sunday, September 20th, after meeting in our parking lot outside for several weeks, we will be moving our worship gathering inside at 10 a.m., so that's next Sunday, September 20th at 10 a.m. Now, we are striving to be as careful as we can possibly be. We're trying to be mindful of everyone's concerns and, and fears. We want to be 
uh, very conscientious about everyone's safety. So please check out the announcement that is on the homepage of our website, brooksav.org, about all the expectations and, and, uh, and everything that we're doing to make this as safe a gathering as possible. And we understand, we understand that if you're not ready for that just yet, that's perfectly fine. We want to remind you that our small groups, many of them continue to meet by Zoom. They are gathering for Zoom virtual gatherings. And some of our small groups, some of our journey groups are also meeting outside to worship. And we want to encourage those to continue to do that. So if you're not comfortable with coming for indoor worship, um, please, we encourage you, please you know, hook up with one of those groups. You can find more information about that also on our webpage. If you look, if you click on the tab for, for journey groups, or if you would like to know what groups are meeting outside, you can also just email us at frontdesk. Dot, I'm sorry, at frontdesk at brooks dot org, and we'll get that information to you. Our text for today is taken from First Peter chapter one. I'm going to be reading verses three through six. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and His great mercy. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. The other day as I was driving down the road, I, I passed by a billboard that had an interesting message. It said, it will get better. Optimism, pass it on. And I thought, well, that's, that's a great message. It's a message that we need, you know, in these times. But then I also thought, uh, well, what is the it that it's referring to? Is it referring to the pandemic crisis and everything associated with that? Is it referring to all the unrest and the division that's, that's been exposed in our nation? Or does it simply refer to things that might be going on in, in the life of whoever happens to drive by and look up and to read that billboard? And, and this thought also occurred to me. What if it doesn't get better, then what? Well, and as I thought about that, you know, I thought, well, you know, that's not an optimistic way to view the message of that billboard. That's actually, that's, that's kind of pessimistic. And, and I'm like everybody else. That bothers me. I, I don't like to be around pessimist. In fact, I don't even like to be around a, a pess optimist. You know what that is, right? A pess optimist is a person who thinks that Everything is going to be okay. It's just that it will be too late. I, I know, 5,000 stand-up comedians out of work and you know, here I am making jokes. I get it. All right. And then an article came to my inbox, an article titled, Optimism is Temporary, Hope is Eternal. So here's another message about optimism. And, and so on the heels of, of seeing that billboard then, you know, I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm supposed to preach on the difference between optimism and biblical hope. And I also thought, optimism is temporary, hope is eternal. That's also a cool title. I think I'll steal it. And here we are. Now, seriously. The article title does make an important point. There's a huge difference between optimism and biblical hope. Optimiz optimism is, is, is a nice trait, a, a desirable trait, to be honest, and, and something that is needed in these pessimistic times. But optimism does not rise to the level of biblical hope. According to the good folks at Merriam-Webster, optimism is, quote, 
an inclination to put the most favorable construction upon actions and events or to anticipate the best possible outcome, end quote. Another definition that's offered is that optimism is, quote, a disposition or tendency to look on the more favorable side of events or conditions and to expect the most favorable outcome. Thanks to the folks at dictionary.com for that. Now, these definitions point out something that McClellan talks about in his article. And his point is that the limitation of optimism and that it is, quote, inherently circumstantial, end quote. In other words, optimism is, is, is a decided upon attitude in response to events or conditions, that is, circumstances. And the problem with circumstances is that they are often fluid and, and they frequently change. For instance, I, I might seemingly have reason to be optimistic based on the circumstances of that day, of that moment. I might have reason to be optimistic one day, only the next day for those circumstances to change, and then I have to, 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 to recalibrate my optimism and, and, and maybe even take a more negative view of those circumstances. Let me give you an example. The stock market goes through a, a week-long rally. And at the end of the week, I'm thinking, wow, my, my retirement portfolio is looking pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. And then on Monday, all of a sudden, the stock market takes a nosedive. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's, that's just a temporary thing. It's going to be better tomorrow. Tuesday, it's down. Wednesday, it's down. The entire week, the stock market is down. And then one week turns into another week. And that week turns into a third week and a fourth week. And after a, a month-long decline, all of a sudden, I'm not so optimistic about my retirement portfolio. Maybe I'm a little pessimistic and fearful because the circumstances have changed. On a more serious note, maybe, maybe somebody gets a, a good report on their most recent cancer scan and they're feeling optimistic about that. And maybe even thinking that, hey, I'm going to be healed only to go back for a follow-up scan six months later and to find that the cancer has come roaring back. And then there's the message, you know, I don't know that there's anything else that we can do. The circumstances can be very fluid and optimism can be very temporary. And another, another limitation of circumstances is that they are subject to perception and and even interpretation. Um, for instance, you and I both might be looking at the same set of circumstances. You look at those circumstances, the same ones that I'm looking at, the same situation that I'm looking at, and, and you might feel optimistic. Now, I might be looking at those same circumstances, and, and for other reasons, I might be feeling less optimistic. In fact, I might even be feeling a little cautious or, or fearful, but we're looking at the same set of circumstances. And that's why Peter's words to the faith community of his day are so important for us today. Peter is writing to a group of believers, a faith community, in, in which many of them have been experiencing sufferings and difficult times because of their faith in Christ. He begins the letter with an outburst of praise Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he declares what God has done in Christ and in his resurrection. It's a great way to begin the letter. Positive, upbeat, uplifting, purposeful. Because he then immediately moves into the harsh realities that many of them were experiencing. For instance, 
And the last part of verse 6, as we read a moment ago, now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. He addresses that again in chapter 4 and verse 12, as he writes, now, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you are suffering, as though some strange thing has happened to you. So in light of the circumstances, Peter realized that, that his brothers and sisters, that, that his readers needed more than cheery optimism. They needed hope. They needed something that would sustain them. And that's why he says in chapter one, verse 13, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled and set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. He could have said, hey, now look on the bright side. Things, things are probably going to get better when there was no reason to think that they really were going to get better. Or he could have just let them drown in despair. But he didn't do that. Instead, he exhorts them neither to optimism, nor does he abandon them to despair, but rather he points them to hope. But what exactly is hope? It's an expectation that is grounded not in fluid circumstances, but rather in the reality of Christ's resurrection from the dead. As Peter wrote in the opening, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope is more than optimism. Hope is more than wishful thinking. Hope is an expectation that is, that is grounded in the power of God, demonstrating in the raising of Jesus Christ that, that, that broke the stranglehold of death upon a fearful humanity. And Peter writes that, that because hope is, is grounded in the resurrection life of Jesus, that it is therefore a living hope, a hope to be distinguished from all the hopes that, that the world might offer people. It, it, it's a hope with, with substance and, and, and power and, and effectiveness. It's hope generated not by my own will, by, by my own desires or my own power, but rather a hope generated by, by the power and the will of God in Christ. It's a hope, it, it, it's something that's not dependent upon circumstances, but rather it endures through and beyond and over our circumstances. And in addition, Peter says that, that by God's mercy, we are also born into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you. This inheritance transcends the temporary. It transcends the fluid nature of, of, of life and circumstances. It, it, it transcends the corruptible nature of this creation. It's beyond our current experience, beyond our current world. Our hope is for and our inheritance is of a new creation. He writes about this in his second letter to this faith community in chapter 3. Verse 13, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And the Apostle John, and what we know today as the book of Revelation, would expand upon this kind of hope, this, this, the new heavens and the new earth. He writes in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 6, of, of the fact that the dwelling of God is with men and he will be with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old, the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything 
new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then John continues, he said to me, it is done. That is our hope. That's what we stand to inherit. That's what we are promised. And what God has promised is as good as done. Now, again, optimism says, or I, or, or we believe that things are going to get better. But again, what if they don't? What's the power or the benefit of optimism if things don't get any better? Hope, grounded in the resurrection of Christ Jesus, says that even if things don't get better here, we still have something sure to cling to, something that will sustain us and something that will impact and change our lives as we live in the meantime, as we live between the now and the not yet. As McClellan writes in his article, quote, Peter does not assure them the persecution will die down soon. He doesn't claim God will reward their faithfulness and suffering with health and wealth and influence. He doesn't paint them a picture of the day when Christianity becomes the official religion of the empire, end quote. He doesn't promise any of those things. Peter realizes that optimism would not be enough for his brothers and sisters. They needed more than optimism. They needed eternal hope. They needed eternal hope to help them endure and to outlast the realities of their lives. In much the same way, I can't tell you today, I, I, I can't promise you today that you're going to get a better job than the one that you lost. I, I can't tell you, you know, hey, hey, look up. You're, you're, probably, you're probably going to get a, a, another job next week. I, I, can't, I can't promise you that. I, I can't tell you that the pain of losing a loved one is going to go away. I can't promise you that. Nor can I promise you that your disease is going to be healed. I, I can't tell you with any certainty at all that, that your life is going to get any better at all, not in terms of the, the circumstances, but I can tell you, I can tell you this, I can tell you that God has given us a living, sure hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I can tell you that we have an inheritance far more glorious than anything that we can know here. So maybe somebody needs to put up a billboard that says optimism is temporary. Hope is eternal. That's the good news for today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for gathering with us. Uh, Lord willing, uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. September 20th at 10 a.m. 
if not, please, please look into one of our journey groups, one of our small groups gathering in different places outside around the county or join another group by, by Zoom. Uh, and if you can't check out our live stream at 10 o'clock, hey, it'll be put into our YouTube channel and you can check it out there. Glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah.